Buonasera a tutti, grazie mille per essere venuti a questo appuntamento che conclude la prima puntata di OGRU che è andata da febbraio sino ad ora. Ci sarà poi un intervallo di un paio di mesi, riprenderemo a settembre con questo ciclo di incontri, talk e lecture performances. Uh, sono Barbara Casavecchia, ho curato questo ciclo di lecture performances per uh, conto della Fondazione Arte CRT e questa sera è con uh, grande piacere che vi presento Gernot Wieland. Gernot, e leggo perché preferisco evitare di fare errori, <ride> è un artista nato in Austria nel 1968 e vive e lavora a Berlino. Spesso realizza performance, ma altrettanto spesso video, come in occasione di una mostra recente. Uh, nel 2017 ha vinto il premio Mosten Open 20 Award. Tra le sue mostre più recenti c'è Super Deals a Bruxelles, Ideal Types da Hero ad Amsterdam, Survival Kit al centro Latvian di arte contemporanea di Riga, uh, The Museum of Modern Comedy in Art a Proposal per il Projects Art Center di Dublino nel 2017, e Context, Lettrotage a Berlino, e via di seguito, I, non credo di poterveli leggere tutte, sono molte, molte le mostre dell'ultimo periodo. Um, Gernut in questa serata ci presenta un uh, talk dal titolo Depression in Animals, cioè depressione negli animali. Il registro, come spesso succede nel suo caso, è sempre in bilico tra l'ironia e temi che invece apparentemente ironici non sono. Quindi se vi viene da ridere, per favore fatelo. <laughs> Your turn. Ok. Um, yeah. um, hello everybody. Um, my name, thank you, Barbara, <laughs> for inviting me. And uh, I'm very excited to give this talk. It will be about 45 minutes long. Grazie mille. Grazie per essere qui, eccetera, eccetera. Eh, questo talk durerà all'incirca 45 minuti. E vedrete alcune immagini. Io parlo di parlare, c'è un short film e un po' di sound. Vedrete delle immagini, poi ci sarò io che parlo. Vedrete anche un breve film, ci saranno dei suoni. E i will give, I will hold my talk in English, but uh, you will find the, under the images there will be subtitles like in a movie. Io parlerò in inglese, ma come succede quando si va al cinema, al di sotto delle immagini ci saranno i sottotitoli. E, e quindi i sottotitoli in italiano e quindi è insomma, abbastanza facile seguire tutto quanto. Yeah, and after my talk, if there are any questions, please um, feel free to ask. E se al termine del talk ci saranno delle domande, per cortesia, siate assolutamente... Sono, sarò più che felice di rispondere. Ok. Ok, io vado alla postazione al computer. Um, yeah, okay, we can switch, yeah. In my talk, I will try to comment 
on historical developments between animals and human beings. For me, the most important question has always been, what do we see, what do we want to see? I would like to start my lecture with a quiz. And in this picture you see, also in this picture, you see four paintings. Two of them were painted by monkeys and two by contemporary artists. I want you now to take a close look and see if you can find a distinction between these four paintings. Now I need your participation. Those who think the painting at the top right, the black and white one, was painted by a monkey, please raise your hand. Okay. Then the top left, if you think it was painted by a monkey, please raise your hand. And the bottom right, and the bottom left. Well, the solution is, all four were painted by monkeys. I had my first experience with depression in animals when I was 14. There was this schoolmate of mine who was an orphan and lived in a home. He was considered a bit weird, not least because he brought his dog, a German shepherd, to school and to classes, even sports, all the time. There was some fuss about it, especially with the cleaning stuff, but after a while, everybody accepted that. One day we had biology class and we learned about sodomy. And my classmate with the German shepherd all of a sudden raised his hand and said, but sir, my dog likes that. Here's a drawing of our classroom. I tried to reconstruct the moment he said that. A few months later, he killed himself and his German shepherd with sleeping pills. He always told me how sad and depressed they both were. I do remember we were told he was listening to music by Bach when he committed suicide. Back then I already thought, what music does the animal listen to when a human commits suicide? It's the music of the human. When making the drawing, I realized that I remember distinctly the situation where everyone was sitting when he said that. I even remembered that the dog had a walk around in the classroom, always the precise same walk. I remember the stuffed animals in the back of the classroom being placed on plinth, like an art exhibition. Our biology teacher had stuffed them because that was his hobby, his only hobby, as he often said. There was a taxidermist dog on one of the plinths, a poodle called Lucky, the former dog of the teacher. He taxidermized it after it had died. When facing the blackboard and the teacher, we felt the eyes of the dead animals on us. It was strange. After having read Totem and Taboo by Sigmund Freud a few years later, I finally understood the complexity of this, I would say, almost Greek drama of the classroom. The teacher, Lucky, his beloved but dead dog, he talked to the dog during biology class as if the dog was still alive. The dead pupil and his lover, the German shepherd, absent but present. The dead animals staring at you. It did something to us. It was like Oedipus and Romeo and Julia in one animal human play. Depression derives from the Latin word deprimere, to press down. The symptoms are sadness, anxiety, sleeping disorder, or feelings of emptiness, feelings of worthlessness, or guilt and suicide attempts. 
Depressed animals show similar symptoms as depressed humans. Dogs, for instance, bite and scratch themselves until they bleed. In wild animals, depression is hard to diagnose, of course, but compared with pets, the depression rates are extremely low. Animals kept as pets have a much higher rate of depression diagnosis and are often treated with psychopharmaca called Prozac. The financial magazine The Economist estimates the overall rate of the antidepressant market for animals at an annual $1 billion in the US alone. Depression in animals is almost only caused by humans and goes hand in hand with the repression of wildness. The construction of human identity can also be determined by the exclusion and control of the other, namely the animal. This history is largely a history of control and power. Historically, the relationship between humans and animals has been dualistic. Both humans and animals were autonomous and related. <clears throat> well, you can see here a DNA sample of a monkey and myself, and as you can see, it's completely similar. There's no difference. Aristoteles, for example, emphasized this kin-like relationship. He stresses the value of the study of even lower animals and points out that what we see as natural and beautiful about them is not expressed in their individual parts, but rather in how these parts work together in the animal as a whole. Or Plutarch, who in his collection Moralia posed the question, which animals are more reasonable, more intelligent, creatures of the land or creatures of the sea? Plutarch was an adherent of the doctrine of the transmigration of souls and provides numerous pieces of evidence for animal intelligence. The significant break came with René Descartes, who made a separation between body and soul. In his perceptions, animals did not have a soul and their body was reduced to the principles of physics and therefore nothing but a machine. The animal became part of the human being and the real animal became an object and disappeared. Because Descartes defined the human by excluding the animal and by excluding the wildness of the humans, because the mind is meant to rule. Karl Marx mentioned that Descartes saw the animal already with the eyes of the manufacturing period. He saw them as a product. And the products serve the humans. This significant break by Descartes is still obvious when we're talking about nature. We always mean an area without humans. The human being became a stranger, a disturbing factor. In the progress of civilization, the often quoted humanization of the animal demonstrates the desire of humans for an animal which must not be autonomous and independent and has to be humanized in a zoo or as a comic figure, as a pet or toy. That, for instance, leads us to project certain qualities on an animal according to how it looks. Here we have, let's say, a happy animal and a sad animal. The most common heraldic animal are leon and eagle. They are referred to as king in the animal kingdom. This hierarchy also indicates that we no longer see the animals as what they are, but use this interpretation as a symbol of power. Heraldic animals seldom look like this. 
I was at an artistic research conference last year, and my contribution was a study about if you would rather be killed by a lion, an anaconda, or a crocodile, and why. We could actually do a quiz again, so do you want to translate? If you would rather be killed by a, by a lion, please raise your hand. And by an anaconda? An anaconda? You have to choose one animal. <laughs> so we start again. Lion? Leone? And anaconda? Anaconda? And crocodile? Coccodrillo. So many. Well, I guess Italy is different. <laughs> uh, because, as you can see as in my study, there were almost a thousand participants I had asked, and the result was that 87% choose a lion and 11 an anaconda, and only 2% are crocodiles. But um, I have to rearrange my study. I have to. <laughs> my research showed that they decided after what they had inscribed into the animal, because a an, uh, veterinarian uh, said that uh, being killed by a lion is actually the most painful. They rather wanted to be killed by a sublime animal than by an animal which caused less pain when killing you, like an anaconda. Keeping an animal as a pet is also a symbol of control and dependence. Humans buy an animal, name it, feed it, castrate it, walk with it on a leash, keep it at home, often in a cage, and what is most important, we define their space. If you look at a caged animals in a zoo, that becomes obvious, defining and controlling their space, often in this particular order. Defining space can be symbolically interpreted as a symbol of the victory of the mind over the body, a victory of control. A floor plan of a zoo is, to me, an epitaph of a relationship between humans and animals, which has definitely ended. This eagerness of isolating, of defining space, can be detected as the wish and the desire to symbolically control your own unpredictable animalistic wildness, to control the uncanny. The uncanny, says Sigmund Freud, is not something new or something strange, but something familiar, which became alienated through repression. The uncanny effect of animalistic behavior could be explained through this repression. This could also explain our melancholic view on nature, which derives from the fact that the human is excluded from it, and nature has only a significance if it is without any human intervention. Depression in animals can lead to suicide and is often documented. During my childhood, there was an animal park near where we lived. Here's a picture from a Super 8 film my mother was taking while my father was driving. One zebra often tried to escape, but got caught every time, and according to a member of the staff of the park, became obviously depressed. But each time, after a while, the zebra pulled itself together in order to escape again. Having caught after its seventh attempt at escape, they took the zebra back on a truck, and the zebra jumped off the truck with its legs pressed tightly to its body like this, and its head outstretched. A zebra, um, as a result, it broke its neck and died immediately. 
A zebra jump like this had never been observed before. And zebras actually never do that. All the park workers and the doctors, the vets, were certain that it had committed suicide. I visited that park as a child, and this is where I heard the story. It left me sleepless and moved me so much that for a long while I constantly drew zebras. This is one of the pictures that my parents kept. And here is another one. I couldn't stop making drawings of zebras. At one point, my parents motivated me to do a potato print of zebra. Because of my obsession, we constantly ran out of paper, and it takes much longer to do one potato print than to just make a drawing. I made potato prints also of other animals which we saw in the park, like birds or monkeys. I think my parents often, without telling me, regretted having introduced potato prints to me. Now we not only had no paper, but often also no potatoes at home. And if we had any, they were full of colors. I stole potatoes from our neighbors, from the land of the farmers. There were literally no potatoes left in my village. And of course, I got caught. And I remember sitting with this child psychiatrist in his room full of pictures of Flipper, Donald Duck, and nice but imbecile looking dogs. And he asked me, Gernot, how did you get here? Why did you steal half a million of potatoes? And I remember it was not my voice, but something in me said, because the zebra was so sad. I want to go back to the first picture with the paintings uh, by the monkeys, not by the artist, as we know now. There are many artists who painted with monkeys in order to acquire an original, free-of-the-kind mind of painting, a free-of-the-mind kind of painting. Some monkeys actually became quite famous through that, and the most famous one was a monkey called Congo. Amongst others, Pablo Picasso bought paintings by Congo. And Congo had an exhibition in the ICA in London in 1957, and the exhibition was sold out immediately. That's a wish many artists have, I think. <laughs> um, Congo made more than 400 drawings and paintings, and he belonged to the well-known natural scientist Desmond Morris. And that is the language, that kind of language you find all the time. He belonged. Desmond Morris experimented with Congo in order to analyze his motivations for doing paintings, which led to Congo just drawing some lines quickly in order to get a banana. Desmond Morris said, it's the sickest way of commercial artistic expression. And I have to say, he's, he's right, I mean, I, well, yeah. And he also said something which I can <clears throat> also agree with. The motivation of a monkey painting pictures has hardly any other reasons than an artist painting a picture. The last animal I'm going to talk about is Flipper, but um, we watch a little clip now. Movie stars have been discovered in many different places. In Zodafop, on Hollywood Boulevard, and right on the sets of the studios. But now for the first time, a glamorous new star has been discovered in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's Flipper, the fabulous dolphin. What kind of a movie is this? It's a brand new entertainment experience, like a fresh ocean breeze. It's the story of a dolphin, an amazing one, and a boy who becomes his friend. And it's the story of their wonderful adventures together. A 
story of fun times, out boating and skin diving. Come on, Sandy. Flipper is also the story of a stalwart dad and a pretty mom. Try to understand, son. If the dolphins come, they tear our nets, they eat our fish, they chase the rest away. If they come, we'll kill them. Even Flipper? Even Flipper. Flipper 2 is a story of spectacular events and excitement, of hurricanes and fire and vivid human drama. Mr. A story of kindness and heroism when the boy saves his friend's life. And a drama of stark terror when Flipper turns about and saves his friend from the killer sharks. Yes, Flipper is a story with a new kind of hero. You may not understand everything he says. But he will steal your heart without saying a word. So, um, uh, Flipper is the star of several movies and a TV series that started with a movie. And maybe you remember it, it's two kids, Bud and Sandy and Flipper. And like many other animal stars, such as Lassie, Fury or Tintin, Flipper has a superhuman intelligence and moral competence. Such as being able to make the distinction between good and bad, or being a friend. This turns him into a perfect friend, a protector, and a crime spotter in the film. The first movie that starred Flipper, played by the dolphin Mitzi, was made in 1963 and was followed by a TV series broadcast between 1964 and 1967 on NBC. In the series, five different dolphins played Flipper. To turn a dolphin into a movie star, you have to catch it, tame it, and put it into a pool. Again, defining space. Dolphins love to hear music, mostly in D major. And one American newspaper published that they especially loved to hear waltz, also walzer, by Johann Strauss, which uh, provoked a hysterical reaction in the Austrian press. The squeaking voice of Flipper was recorded in Hollywood and is mostly the voice of animal sound imitator Melvin Leblanc. The voices of the animals at the beginning of my talk are by Leblanc as well, all three of them. The voices in both films and TV series are at no time produced by animals themselves, only by human beings. In the film it looks like Flipper is living in freedom, but he actually was kept, or they were kept, in a saltwater lake near the studio. The film and TV series were commercially incredibly successful. When the film started, only three dolphinariums, that's where they keep the dolphins in a circus, existed. Today, there are over 200 around the world. And everything, all the talked about in the trailer, the freedom and the, the friend and the friendship, that's all, that's all fake news. And I learned this uh, sentence in Italian. I'm trying. Quello che abbiamo visto nel trailer sono fake news. I learned fake news is a global word. The longer the series took, the more the dolphins became irritated and wilder, which was a big problem for the film. 
because the juvenile actors playing the main characters became more and more scared. And that didn't fit the script because Flipper was supposed to be a friend of, and, a, of, and pet of the children. After finishing the film, the dolphins were no longer needed and were put back in different dolphinariums. They tried to put them in a dolphin show, but they were too well trained and didn't want to do the simple tricks. Nobody worked with them anymore, and they were left alone. Two of them, Susie and Kathy, I think you can see them here from the left to the right, Susie and Kathy, contracted severe depression. You could say they got depressed because they lost their job. And they became completely apathetic. Susie was sold to a traveling circus as the original flipper and died soon after of pneumonia. The former trainer of the dolphins, Richard O'Berry, who later became an animal rights activist, was called in because Kathy, who you can see in the picture to the, to the left, to the right, sorry, <laughs> was in agony as well. His original quotation, what I saw made me speechless. Kathy's head and all of her back was covered in black blisters. She was lying off on the surface. For a long time, I couldn't make out any movements. I jumped into the pool and she swam slowly towards into my arms. We touched each other for a moment. Then I felt all the life going out of her body. We are constructing our human identity by the exclusion and control of the other. And we are building nations, governments, societies on this exclusion. Karl Marx wrote in 1847, in proportion as the exploitation of one individual by another will be put to an end, the exploitation of one nation by another will be put to an end. This quote can be read in a psychoanalytical way and can be used to study our relationship to animals. Today, the exploitation of any other is so enormous we don't even know what a banana tastes like anymore. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we wanted to just uh, get back to you if you have any questions or we can also do that in a smaller audience, I don't know. I can also sit on the stage and answer some questions if there are. Yeah. Grazie. <laughs> Dunque, ciao Gernot, tu mi conosci molto bene. Allora, la, mi hai fatto riflettere sui miei due gatti che sono a casa, che tu conosci. E ho capito quello che già avevo in dubbio con la veterinaria, cioè entrambi sono sterilizzati. Il più grande soffre di depressione per tutto quello che tu ci hai spiegato in questa tua eh, illuminante conferenza. Speravo non fosse così, fossero solo malattie, ma lui praticamente è depresso, bulimico, perché ultimamente sta proprio male ed è questione della persona con cui convive che tu conosci molto bene che è mio padre eh, per lui sono indispensabili perché lui è depresso e con uh, questi due gatti riesce a combattere la sua depressione perché è sempre solo visto che io lavoro tutto il giorno e ho notato che quando lui non c'è loro due non stanno male cioè il più grande non, ha, non, non vomita non ha problemi di solitudine, cioè reagisce molto, sta bene, felice. Quindi vedendo come animali che, gli animali che ci hai descritto tu, 
mi hai fatto capire che purtroppo è proprio vero, l'egoismo umano porta alla depressione e al desiderio di suicidarsi di questi animali. Penso che questi due animali stiano sopravvivendo perché ci sono io. Il giorno che io dovessi mai lasciarli con mio padre si lasciano morire tutti e due. E questa è una cosa molto molto triste. Poi ti spiego perché io ho scelto il leone. Perché il leone, anche se mi fa, fa male, eh, non è perché è un animale splendido, per carità lo è, però io ho una paura spaventosa dell'anaconda, mi fa molta paura, come ho anche molta paura del, dell'alligatore o del coccodrillo. Cioè proprio io il terrore, preferisco farmi <ride> torturare e sbranare da un leone che no, essere ingoiata da un'anaconda o, da, o, o triturata da, dal, dal coccodrillo. E poi mi ha, non sapevo della, del, della tua, di questa cosa, di questo ragazzo, di, del cane. È stato molto utile, molto interessante e, e conferma tante persone che io conosco nella mia zona che convivono con dei cani che gli fanno praticamente da terapisti. E ho una vicina di casa che sta combattendo per sopportare il marito che è malato e in senso affettuoso ovviamente sopportarlo e lei stessa purtroppo ha un tumore ha un cancro ai polmoni e questo cane la sta aiutando anche se è depresso a sua volta ad andare avanti yeah. quindi io mi chiedo se non avessimo più questa, questa cosa degli animali anche se è un nostro grosso egoismo noi umani ci, 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 insomma, non esisteremmo più quindi ti chiedo questo um. Um, yeah, um, I don't want to, you need to translate as well, I guess. I don't want to uh, pose myself as a, um, that's very important to me, as a moral competence or so. I mean, we are all inflicted. Non And vorrei pormi come qualcuno che ha una competenza morale, in qualche modo <laughs> ne soffriamo tutti delle situazioni. And um, strangely enough, I mean, this talk I wrote I'm changing it every time when I'm performing it, e per quanto sembri strano io continuo a cambiare il testo di questa conversazione ogni volta che la interpreto But I wrote it five years ago. ma l'ho scritta cinque anni fa e um, ho researching a lot about this depression in animals and I mean starting researching is an endless thing and it often it's not a... e avevo iniziato a quel punto a fare molte ricerche sul tema della depressione negli animali poi ovviamente iniziare una ricerca vuol dire incontrare anche moltissimi materiali e continuare ad espandere il campo che si sta studiando but was what so striking me most that when you you're born in certain structures that you do not question the Ever. And I mean, this is also our relation to animals is so. Ma una cosa che mi ha colpito <coughs> è che nel momento in cui nasci all'interno di alcune strutture, a volte non ti poni neanche il problema di porle in discussione. E questo, per esempio, riguarda quello insomma, attorno al quale si articola la nostra relazione con gli animali, la diamo per scontata. And, um, Like a couple of weeks ago we also got two cats and I know this we are doing the same what I was talking about and I uh, e da un paio di settimane anche noi abbiamo due gatti e in realtà anche noi stiamo facendo quello di cui parlavo nella conversazione But I think at least to me it is like that that I I should never forget that we have them just be, not for their sake this is not animal this is not animal loving but it's they're only there for me Maybe that's an okay reason. And, e credo but, che insomma, sia corretto ricordarsi di tanto in tanto che in effetti non sono lì per loro libera scelta perché come dire, sono travolti dall'amore nei nostri riguardi ma perché noi abbiamo bisogno di quella relazione e di, di, di quell'affetto. Ma uh, mio son, che è 12, e tu lo sai, ha detto qualcosa which uh, I uh, thought was hilarious. He said, uh, you should not forget if they were bigger, they would eat us, you know? <laughs> e mio figlio che ha 12 anni ha detto una cosa che io ho trovato molto divertente ed è, beh, però non dovresti mai dimenticarti che se fossero più grandi di così ci mangerebbero. And that's a fact, yeah. E questo è un fatto. 
É. Uh, did, did you decide to have those two animals for you, for your son, or to study them and study their behavior? No, for, um, because um, for various reasons, I think, for all the family, yeah. Per molte ragioni, mm -hmm. anche per la famiglia. Yeah, are there any other questions? All right. Papa. I have a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But the question is, um, e la mia domanda è la seguente, quanto di quello che ci racconti è vero? Perché ovviamente, come dire, mezzo milione di patate è una cifra abbastanza importante. <laughs> so, how much of what you've been telling us is actually true? Because I think that half a million potatoes, it's quite a number. It was actually more than a million, but I want to... <laughs> Sound, make the story sound more likely. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> e che in realtà erano più di un milione, però poi gli sembrava che sarebbe sembrata esagerata questa storia e ha deciso di abbassare un po' il numero. A story in your head and I don't want to stop the story or you know. Okay. Quando, ed è una cosa che mi viene chiesta molto spesso e mi chiedono ma insomma questa storia è vera oppure no? Cerco sempre di non rispondere perché in realtà quello che mi interessa è accendere una storia nella testa di qualcuno dove poi deve continuare a lavorare e svilupparsi. Yeah, and then it would, it would stop the story or take something away from what I've just been doing and I realized that when talking about the content of truth... E quindi, cioè, dare una risposta di qualsiasi tipo non farebbe che fermare quella storia che inizia a raccontarsi da sé nell'immaginazione di qualcun altro e il fatto che mi trovassi poi a ridiscutere una cosa che ho appena fatto in termini di verità o meno ne darebbe una lettura... Sbagliata. Yeah. I, I sound like a politician, you know, talking about the content of truth is taking the fun away. So. <laughs> Adesso sembra un politico che parla del contenuto di verità, eccetera, eccetera, e quando uno fa così poi non ci si diverte più. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's, bet it's better to speak English or maybe in Italian, poi magari la traduce. Ok, facciamo in italiano. Eh, è solo uno spunto di riflessione. Eh, forse noi non consideriamo che tutti gli animali, beh, a parte forse i delfini eh, di cui ha parlato, li abbiamo inventati noi. Cioè non esistono i cani, i gatti, i polli in natura, i cavalli. Eh, sono tutte, tutti animali che abbiamo costruito nel nostro, diciamo, eh, yeah. nel nostro sviluppo, nella nostra civiltà, soprattutto nel Neolitico sono stati realizzati. Quindi probabilmente da lì viene l'alineazione eh, che questo tipo di anima questi animali diciamo, poi alla fine soffrono. Mm. Just to yeah. think about that and to yeah. uh, talk yeah. about that. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I totally. No, no, no dog. Yeah, yeah, no. We have invented all those animals. Yeah. Ten thousand years ago. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to. I I I, I agree. Well, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, no, no, of course I agree. Um, Yeah, uh, I don't know really what to say to it, except that I agree. No, no, it, it is weird when, like, uh, for instance, I, uh, I come from a village where everybody has a dog, and it's weird because they just live because uh, of us humans. And I assume dogs were always in the world. Yeah. Yeah. You were saying that in your village there are... Vengo da un paese molto piccolo, da un villaggio, dove ovviamente quasi tutti hanno dei cani. Yeah, yeah. They're all the time, they're there all the time, yeah. 
Okay, I'm not sure it answers this question, <laughs> to be honest. I did not answer. Was there a question? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I agree. It's a good point, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Perfettamente d'accordo. <laughs> For me, it was also, that's why I, when, when researching, it's that's how we behave, you know, with animals, or how our relationship is to Quando animals. Quando ho iniziato a fare ricerca su questo argomento, ovvero come ci comportiamo con gli animali, qual è la nostra relazione con gli animali? It, it hasn't been like that. It's not like every culture has the same kind of relationship, you know. It's, it, it's In effetti, è, è molto chiaro che non tutte le culture hanno la stessa relazione nei confronti degli animali. That we, let's say, destroy nature and animals in a, with machines, you know, it's, it's, uh, okay. it doesn't exist in every nature, it was not always no, there. Non tutte le culture hanno l'abitudine di distruggere la natura, aggredirla con delle macchine, avere una determinata relazione con gli animali come la nostra, insomma. And this, I think, with nature, with animals or the other, so to speak, you know, it's to... Ed è How, how we define each other to the other and how we treat Come the other, I think. Come ci definiamo in relazione a quello che chiamiamo l'altro eh, e, e come lo trattiamo e via di seguito, in fin dei conti, è il punto cruciale. <laughs> yeah. Come here, please. Yeah. Otherwise it's always swapping. <laughs> Faccio in italiano e tu traduci, ok? Eh, volevo fare una domanda legata un po' a, a questo posto, perché qui a Torino tutti conoscono la storia di Nietzsche, che è vissuto qua alla fine del XIX secolo, e, e appunto la storia racconta che lui, mentre camminava per la, per la, strada, di, per la strada di Torino, ha visto un, un mercante che ha iniziato a picchiare il proprio cavallo e, e Nietzsche la sua reazione è stata quella di appunto correre lì e cercare di difendere questo, questo cavallo e, 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 e dicono anche che, insomma, che lui era già depresso a, a quel tempo però questa situazione come lui ha vissuto questa situazione ha aggravato ancora di più la sua depressione che poi Insomma, ha durato fino, fino alla fine, fino yeah, alla sua morte. La cosa, adesso non sappiamo quello, cosa è vero di questa storia, ma penso che, come nel caso del tuo talk, non è importante. La cosa interessante è la reazione delle persone che c'è stata, no? perché a quel, quel tempo um, la reazione delle persone è stata negativa. Sembra che lui... È, le persone non riuscivano a capire come mai Nietzsche aveva reagito in questo modo, no? era assolutamente inusuale, quasi folle. E dopo cento anni, più di cento anni, una reazione del genere sarebbe assolutamente normale, cioè non solo normale, ma anzi anche favorevole. Quindi quello che volevo, volevo chiedere, ehm, cioè questo non, è, non manifesta in qualche modo il fatto che questa relazione tra umani e animali sia in qualche modo cambiata, no? O, o come hai detto tu alla fine della tua presentazione, semplicemente si tratta di, um, di una trasformazione, di, di un rapporto di violenza diretta a um, dei, delle modalità, come dire, di oppressione che sono semplicemente un po' più sofisticate. Oh, okay. cioè, Uh, how this relation if it's maybe it could be um, like it's manifesting somehow the fact that this relationship are changing and um, they are uh, evaluating no? because it's uh, not uh, normal anymore to do like this and the reaction of the people will be like this and in this sense Nietzsche was kind of anticipating mm -hmm. no, some tendencies he was kind of progressive yeah uh, so i was, or oh, it's not, uh, how, how do you, what do you think about this? If it's, or it's just changing a way to, to relate to animal, but like it's not, it's maybe more formal, not like deep, not fundamental. Yeah, well, if you regard Nietzsche, then uh, of course he was uh, in opposition to this rationalism in a way. Se pensi a Nietzsche, è ovvio che si poneva in opposizione a quello che era il razionalismo. 
And if we look at cultures who have a strong a kin-like relationship to animals, they didn't go through this school of rationalism like Europe did. E se pensi a culture che non sono state attraversate da questa scuola, da questa impronta razionalista fortissima come quella occidentale ed europea, è vero che le cose cambiano. And uh, one can only hope that he was anticipating it, yeah. E uno può solo sperare che in effetti si stesse anticipando, come dire, un pensiero più diffuso. I mean, I, I'm very interested in, in the way we define the other, or like, let's say, a subject in the society. I think a lot of... Mi interessa of my... molto il modo col quale definiamo l'altro come soggetto all'interno di una società. And I think a lot of my work is about it, and I used animals, uh, it interested me how we define animal as the other, I think that was the initiative. Quello che, come dire, il motivo per cui ho iniziato a occuparmi di questo tema è che di fatto abbiamo l'abitudine a definire l'animale come l'altro e quindi sono partito da lì per tutto il mio lavoro. But also, for instance, I don't know, Schopenhauer, you know, he had a poodle. Anche Schopenhauer aveva un yeah. cane da compagnia. And they were almost like, they were like married. You know? Ed era come se fossero sposati. And Schopenhauer talked to his poodle. And when e I, Schopenhauer parlava con il suo cane. And he called him a human being and when he was behaving bad. You e know, gli diceva so. che insomma, era come un essere umano e quando si comportava male. But um, when like doing the research for this, for this work, I, I realized the relationship Schopenhauer had with his poodle and then I realized Our philosophical system is based on a philosopher who was married to a poodle and that kind of, that kind of gave me security. E quindi, nel fare ricerca per questo talk ho scoperto che un intero sistema filosofico potenzialmente si basava, come dire, sull'esperienza di un filosofo sposato con un cane. That gave me security, yeah. E questo mi ha rassicurato moltissimo. Right. Dice che così la risposta è già, come dire, compresa nella domanda. I think that's worth not forgetting that we are the ones who are choosing, you know, we are the ones who are creating that. Bisogna ricordare che in effetti siamo noi che creiamo quel tipo di rapporto e siamo noi quelli che fanno la scelta e via di, e via di seguito. So it's, it's our fault I'm if animals are depressed. Well, I mean, there are studies who, who there are real studies, I didn't make that up. And, uh, Dice che non mi sono inventato tutto, ci sono in effetti degli studi che insomma lo, lo spiegano con una certa quantità di dati. For instance, there is a clinic in the US, it's for depressed animals and they are treated... Uh, Negli Stati Uniti ci sono, c'è cioè, una clinica insomma per animali depressi che vengono trattati insomma come umani depressi, I imagine. Yeah. And uh, these things happen, but we are causing it. And all the studies say that wild animals, they also they cannot be depressed because they would not survive. You know? eh, gli studi dicono peraltro che certo, eh, gli animali in natura sono molto meno depressi, ma non potrebbero neanche esserlo perché altrimenti non sopravviverebbero. So if they are depressed, they are being eaten, basically. Yeah? Sì, so. sì, sì, se ti deprimi troppo ti mangiano. <laughs> <laughs> When you think it's, I mean, what is the correct measure? I mean, of depression? No, of the relationship. 
I, I think you have to answer that. I, I cannot be the... Uh, I think we should not forget that they are animals. I think we're forgetting. I mean, that's also the pleasure of having, for instance, cats, you know, that I can forget that they're animals. And I, I do the same probably you do with your animal, but um, you should not forget if they're bigger, they would eat you. Sì, eh, appunto, uh, non possiamo dimenticarci che sono animali, anche se ci fa molto comodo a volte dimenticarcelo. E come dice mio figlio, neppure bisognerebbe dimenticare che in un contesto diverso, con scale diverse, saremmo noi ad essere mangiati. Something about Karl Marx, I guess? No. No. The man or the human? I mean, the man is it's the deadliest, uh, it's the deadliest animal to women, so, yeah. Sì, eh, parlando di uomo, eccetera, dice sì, in effetti l'uomo è, è l'animale più pericoloso nei confronti della donna, ma è, è anche quello che causa più morti. I mean, that's, yeah, we're also driven by, by, by threats and by fear now. Every politician in Europe seems to work with fear and not Siamo with fact. Siamo trascinati anche da una logica di spavento e paura. È una cosa che la politica in giro per tutta l'Europa tenta evidentemente di sfruttare in questo periodo. But for instance, like 80% of, uh, um, uh, how do you say, homicide? Uh, ma in effetti se si guardano i numeri l'80% degli omicidi I think over 80% is uh, um, in relationships avviene all'interno di quella che è una relazione so it's, uh, that's one big advantage of being a single <laughs> <laughs> ci sono alcuni vantaggi nel rimanere single <laughs> um, yeah are there any more questions? There was no question from this side. No pressure, but... <laughs> yeah, okay. Va bene. Quindi, se non ci sono altre domande, grazie mille a tutti e buona serata. Thank you. E grazie a Gernot. Thank you.